So now I think it's a good moment to stop and uh, summarize briefly our very basic introduction to quantum information science. Um, so what are the take-home messages? Well, probably the most important one I want you to remember is our mantra, information is physical. Remember, information is physical. It really, really is. Honestly, it is, right? Um, information is always encoded in some physical objects, in the properties of sound waves, electrons, photons, you name it. There's no information without physical representation, so there's always underlying physics. So what you can really do with information depends on this underlying physics. So when we include quantum phenomena to our repertoire of information processing, we can do more, right? Because there are certain quantum phenomena we can use to our advantage. So we talk about quantum interference, quantum entanglement, and uh, I try to show to you where quantum information science, actually where quantum physics differs from um, classical description of the world. And, uh, you know, one way of showing this was to point to classical probability theory and, and, and then to quantum physics and compare the two. So we know that uh, if we just use a regular Kolmogorov axioms of probability theory and try to apply those axioms to physical phenomena, then, then they you know, the Kolmogorov axioms do not know about physics. It's, it's a beautiful mathematical concept, that's fine, but uh, the way you have to calculate probabilities um, is to use quantum theory. And uh, the basic difference, and this is another thing I want you to remember from this lecture course, is that instead of adding probabilities, as Kolmogorov would tell us to do, we have to go to complex numbers called probability amplitudes, we add probability amplitudes, we get probabilities by taking mod squares. So if you consider a simple physical process where you can just uh, consider a physical object, whatever that is, it could be a quantum computer that starts in some input state and then goes into several, what we call now superpositions, right? And uh, takes several different computational paths and ends up in some final state. And you ask, what is the probability that your computing device will end up there? Then you look at each computational path, and then you have to look not at probabilities, but probability amplitudes that computation follow that particular path. And then you just add probability amplitudes, take mod square at the end. And then the final expression from the probability has two clear terms. So you can see here, that's your deja vu experience from the first or the second lecture. You have two probabilities. So you have the probability P1, that your computing device will take this path. Probability P2, that it will take this path. And here, classical theory of probability stops. That's it, right? not in quantum world, right? So in the quantum world, you have this one extra term, which you call the interference term, which could be both positive or negative. And sometimes when we want to amplify the answer, because it is a good answer, we want to design our algorithm, quantum algorithm, so that we have a positive interference on some path leading to a certain output, and negative interference on path leading to some other outputs where uh, we have possibly a wrong answer of computation. So, so this actually very simple calculations, very simple mathematics was behind it all. Everything else we said later was like elaboration on this theme. We just, you know, put all those complex numbers into matrices, call them operators, multiply them this way, the other way, divided them into subsystems and so on and so forth. So that, you know, introduced tensor products and so So, so you can then elevate it to more sophisticated mathematics, but at the bottom of it really is this very simple calculation. So don't be fooled by um, abstract mathematics here. So the, the, the at the bottom of quantum theory, there's a very simple calculations of this type. So we, we then showed, uh, we, we then discussed quantum 
advantages. So what are the good things? What is the, the new brave quantum world promising us? So we talk about quantum cryptography, all kind of communication tasks, quantum teleportation, and of course quantum computation. Uh, that is the, the most um, interesting, but also the most challenging. So that is a good side. And then we said, well, you know, it's not easy. Why are we not there? Because there's the quantum noise, because the systems that we want to interfere lose this ability to interfere due to decoherence, due to the fact that those systems interact with the environment. The environment learns which path is taken, and you know, quantum interference is destroyed, as I showed to you. So we talk a little bit about the, the type of quantum noise. We talk about uh, completely positive trace preserving maps. So you see, we just went from here to there. And so we, 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 we sort of elevated our, um, a little bit, the level of sophistication, uh, mathematical sophistication. And then we went to um, discuss quantum error corrections and fault tolerant computation. So the question is, you know, you have this quantum noise that's a bad thing, right? Destroys our quantum interference. Is there anything we can do about it? And then we look at the quantum circuits and quantum logic gates and all those things. And we said, OK, well, there is a way to protect qubits against the coherence. And we can even implement those quantum logic gates in a fault tolerant way. So there is hope for quantum computation. And at the moment, you know, it's, there's lots of excitement. There's lots of, lots of hype about uh, quantum computation. We do hope that one day we'll be able to implement those devices. At least, you know, there's no fundamental reason why we shouldn't be able to implement quantum computation. And if there is a fundamental reason, if one day one of you discovers that it's not possible for some really good reason, that's, that's the best outcome possible, right? Because then we learn something new and profound about the nature. We discover something new. And that something new probably can be used for even more fancy computation. So, so I think that uh, we are not really losing when, when we are sort of looking for ways, for really good ways in which quantum computation is not possible. But you know, so far, uh, it seems that uh, we will be talking to our experimental colleagues, to engineers, and telling them you know, how to go ahead and implement those things. You know, the, the course was more focused on concepts and methods rather than underlying mathematics. Um, there are lecture notes, and you find the links to those uh, lecture notes. Um, so look them up. We will cover different bits and pieces in more detail. And, um, and there will be more lectures coming. I may just uh, take a bit of a break from the, the light bulb scenario and try to see if I can just uh, use other media. But, but you know, all, all together, I think I enjoy this uh, light bulb um, experience. It's been, it's been an interesting experience, trying to squeeze everything into this space and, uh, and uh, use it the best I can. So I, I do hope you learn something new, something interesting. And, uh, and you know, if you're interested in quantum information science, this is a new area. There are lots of excitement there. It is of practical relevance. Uh, there are a number of things yet to be discovered. So if you think about your PhD, you think about your postdoc, whatever, think about quantum information science. OK, so it's enough of my yada, yada, yada. I think it's time to clean the board. and. Uh, I promise that uh, there will be more coming soon, but uh, for now, I think uh, we are going to take a break. <laughs>